I love it. Well, praise God. Y'all have, we all have to admit, it's funny doing things uh, uh, with a very few people. In some cases, I guess none. I, I won't. <laughs> I, had a, I went down to, I, go, I say beach, I guess everybody thinks vacation, but that's where I'm from and have family there. And I went to, uh, I hate to even tell this, probably. I, I was wanting to go to my granddaddy's old church. And, and so I went, and there's nobody, there's nobody there. And so uh, I, go, I go to my 85-year-old first cousin, who's a deacon there, and I'm like, hey, uh, what, where, where's church? What's going on? And he says, oh, we still have church. And I said, well, I went there, and I didn't see anybody. Oh, well, they, nobody comes there but me and Billy Bob. I said, what? He said, we're the only two. I said, where's the people that's over the church? He said, they don't like us. They don't want to come. So the people that's over the church won't come, and they, and they only got two coming, and so they're not even familiar with Corona. And I'm telling you, I looked at that, and I got so sad, and I said, it is time for revival. Can somebody say amen? Not just there, but everywhere. And now I'm going to give you a little sneak announcement I've been waiting to give you. I've been praying about getting some good guest speakers, and all of a sudden, Connie gives me a call from Supernatural, and she said, Ben Hughes and his wife are going to be here in July, and we've told them about you, and they would love to come to your church. I called Ben, and we had a time on the phone. You guys are getting ready to get blessed on July the 5th, like you're not going to believe. I mean, we're going to have us some awesome Husband and wife ministry coming through here with an anointing that breaks and destroys yokes. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. These Australian preachers are powerful. You've probably seen them on it Supernatural anyway. But uh, you're, you're really, really, really going to enjoy them. I kind of don't even know how to start this out because I'm going to tell you what happened, how this came about today as I get started. You can pull the scripture up in Isaiah 61. And so... <laughs> This happens to me sometimes. I don't know why. But I picked up uh, a book that my wife had been writing in her last year of life. And I was just going through the book. This is before anybody ever knew anything about Corona and all these other things. And I just uh, was reading it. And the Spirit of the Lord came on me. And I just was eating it up, and I said, I wish Kathy was here to preach this. And he said, okay, do it. And it hit me. So my wife is going to preach this morning. Are y'all okay? All right. You had not heard her in a while, have you? All right. Well, it's time to hear PK. This is her message. This is her going through a time of life that nobody would ever want to go through. And these are her writings in the Word, in the Scripture, as she had her relationship with God. And for those of you that didn't know my beautiful wife of 45 years of marriage, uh, she beat terminal cancer five times. Unfortunately, in the year 18 of Christmas, it, that was her last one. But my God, what a scrappy woman. But we're all... One of these days going to leave this old planet. Now, you can sit there and wrestle with me and tell me you're not, and you're never going to live, never going to That's fine. Have at it. But according to the Scripture, you're probably going to pass away within 120 years of your birth. Seriously, not being funny. And in that, we not only need to know where we're going and all that good stuff, but what about what we're doing during that first day to 120 years? And my wife in her meditation, began to meditate and read Isaiah 61. And what she wrote down here is about what she was getting out of verses 1 through 7. I want you to listen. In the NIV, this is the scripture that Jesus opened up when he was in the temple. And he read this scripture. And when he read it and said it is fulfilled today, that was the scripture that shocked the religious world. How dare him? And we're still shocking the religious world by thus saith the Lord today. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's on me because, because, so there's a reason. The Lord has anointed me. Look at this, proclaim. 
good news to the poor. What's he telling the poor? <laughs> you ain't got to be poor no more. That's good news. He has sent me to bind up brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim freedom. I love freedom. For the captives. And release from darkness from, for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord, the favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. Listen. And provide to those who give in Zion and bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Beauty instead of ashes? My wife writing. My wife was literally sitting in a bed of ashes writing about joy. And she says here, I mean the word says here, instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning. I, I'm having a time here because as I'm reading it, I remember her worshiping and I'm picturing her, her attitude versus how most people respond to things in life. I have to admit, she responded biblically. I, I'm not trying to make this sermon about her. <laughs> I'm just telling you, the power of the Spirit of the Lord when you're going through something to come upon you to carry you through stuff, it is so awesome. And she was a journalist. She just wrote everything all the time. I'm still reading stuff I've never seen. I've read Revelation knowledge that she had. I don't even know why she didn't preach it. Anyway, whew. instead of mourning, he's given us joy instead of mourning. And he gave us a garment. That's something you put on of praise. I got to put it on. Somebody say, put it on. Yeah. Instead of a spirit of despair. Why did you go in the dirty clothes basket and get out what you wore last week and put it on for why didn't you go to the closet where the nice clean fresh stuff is hello man you don't want no spirit of dirty clothes on you they are going to be called oaks That's, it says oaks because it's referring to the roots the depth you know you can beat the fire out of the tree but it's just coming right back because it's connected to the root that can't be destroyed as a matter of fact, if you study oaks, you'll find every oak tree you ever seen flipped over, it has all the dirt with it. The roots didn't turn. The dirt turned loose, not the tree. Literally. And he calls you an oak. Are you listening? I said, you're an oak. You're going to be called the oaks of right standing with God. The oaks of righteousness. Hallelujah. A planning of the Lord look at this you are for a display of his splendor I was created to be a display of his splendor and they will rebuild you and I listen you talking about oh the corona thing if I went through it, it oh my god they will rebuild the ancient ruins. America's going to rebuild like you've never seen. And restore the places that are long devastated. You watch the power and spirit of God move. And they will never, hallelujah, renew the ruined cities. What's this? That have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Boy. Talking about some help coming. Foreigners are going to work in your field. Somebody's, you, you can bring people. I don't even know them. Have them work for me. And vineyards. And you are going to be called priest of the Lord. My wife gets into this stuff and I do too. And you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations thank God that's starting to happen and in their riches you're going to boast and here's one instead of your shame you will receive a double portion you always get double for your trouble my wife says 
you will receive a double portion instead of disgrace I like to say instead of disgrace you get grace instead of disgrace you're gonna rejoice in your inheritance and so you will inherit a double portion not in heaven in your land and everlasting joy is gonna be yours everlasting joy is going to be yours well after she wrote all of the scriptures down she just began to jot the only way through anything the only way to get out of it is to go completely through it learn to go through not under go through we pass through though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death sickness and disease I will fear listen she didn't I'm not preaching about her I'm saying I saw it work she didn't like that mess I didn't like that mess fear that I never saw fear honestly I never seen a tear I've seen a frown I never saw a tear her faith in her God was to the point she would tell, oh, I want to stay. I want to be with Noah. But if I go, if I go and be with the Lord, man, I'm going to be up there rooting you. I said, what should I root you on? I'm going to keep it. And if I stay, we're just going to get it on. I want to stay. Well, we all wanted her to stay, and I'm, all, I'm not going to measure all that. We're all going one way or the other. But what I'm wanting you to see is, have you ever had a heaviness of a terminal thing that will cost you your life and you're in a battle and you done fought it five times and here you go again? And your attitude is all about how great he is and how wonderful he is? And you still know someday they're going to take that corpse and lay it in the ground because the real you that lives inside of it's not going to be there. That's why it doesn't function. You know why it's called death? Because the life steps out of it. The life didn't leave. The life still exists. It was the life that gave the body all the energy and everything it needed was the spirit, the breath, the spirit of God gives your flesh life. That's why when some people die and the spirit leaves, the Bible says we raise the dead if God permit. I've been with people that have spoken to the dead from accident, spoke to them, and they're confirmed that. Been dead 15, 20 minutes. They're dead. They're covered. And all of a sudden, their body shakes, and they're up. Because breath, spirit, and life went into the flesh. Flesh is dust. It's the earth. It's the spirit. It's from heaven, and it comes from God. That's what rejuvenates. That's what creates. That's what restores. That is the thing that calls the things that be not as though they were, because it's powerful. It is so powerful. And then she, she wrote down, she said, in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God's able to make me have all grace and abound towards you. Woo! And then she wrote this down. I never thought this would have ever happened to me. And then she says, you've got to deal with life, with the word of God. You got life situations, circumstances, setbacks and disappointments and discouragements, sickness and disease and hardships, the death of loved ones and imprisonment, and all of the situations and problems that are in the earth that we face every day. But when you put yourself in an alignment with him, and she's got a great big H-I-M, to receive comfort, to those who mourn, to you, to have the anointing, to go heal the brokenhearted. She was going through all she's going through. She wants to comfort. She wants to heal. She wants the lives change. She, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it. When you put yourself in alignment with him to receive from him, then you comfort those who mourn. You heal the brokenhearted. And now, you remember that song? She wrote down that old song. I have traded my sorrows and I've traded my shame. Remember that one? Oh my God. And then she said, Oh, what I love about my God. He gives me beauty instead of ashes. And then she wrote down with a big star on the side of this. Adam. I'm not sure she liked him a lot. Adam. Oh, he cost you an arm and a leg, she said. She said, Adam opened up the door. 
for sickness and disease and agony and death. But Christ opened up the door for life and health and peace and eternal life. And then she says, now it is time to position yourself for provision. You want provision? Position yourself. Quit walking through the earth, kicking the bag, looking down, looking for something, wondering when God's going to bless you. Look up into the heavens and decree his word and know that he's more than enough. She said, anything you get from God, you're going to have to get it by faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't even please him without faith. So if you do get anything from him, you got to please him with faith. So you're going to have to use your faith to get it. Mm. I, she's got a star down here it says woman praying for groceries doesn't go into anything else but it reminds me I think I think that was a joke that she told one time do y'all remember that it might have been a true story but she would told a story that's what it makes me think of I remember her telling the story about a woman that lived beside an atheist and he gave her a fit because she loved God and she had some kids, no husband. He had passed or something. And that atheist gave them a fit about being religious. And so one day, the atheist heard the woman praying. And she was, oh God, you said that if I would seek you first, you'd meet all of my needs and I need, grow. my kids are getting hungry. I need groceries and I've done this and done that. I'm trusting you, Lord. And I just know you're going to do it. I just know you're going to do it. She's just into it. And he heard it, and it bugged him. Well, he went to the grocery store and bought some groceries and brought them back, and he, and he put them on the porch, and he went to his house. When she got up and went out and saw him on the porch, she started praising God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord did. Well, he heard it. He said, God ain't done nothing. I did that. He said, I'll straighten her out. So he comes stomping out of his house. He walks over to her house. He says, hey, I want you to know God did not do that. I did it. She said, no, you don't understand. She said, I was praying. And I said, oh, God, give me groceries for my family. And the devil been trying to steal from me. And the Lord said, don't you worry. I'll use the devil to bring them back. So anyway, I don't know if y'all got that or not. But the old atheist found out how God used him in a great way. But that's what... <laughs> and that's what she wrote down. She said, woman praying for groceries. And at the end of it, his wife might have said, and she said, I used, uh, God used the devil to get them for me. Hello. And that's something. My wife believed in God so much that Satan became a slave and a servant. Hallelujah. She said, don't you ever... Let people steal from you. What you do is you give it and forget it, and then you will receive a hundredfold return. For if it's stolen from you and you refuse to give it, you only get sevenfold. Learn to give and not be stolen from. In your mortgage resources, you should put money and savings listen money resources put money and savings never too late to start doing the right thing she said you minimum wage folks need to understand you created to be millionaires god's gonna take you from a minimum wage to a millionaire wage she said learn to be conservative in your spending learn to eliminate debt be like god inexpensive Hallelujah, but extravagant. Develop financial stability. You must change your old costly habits. They will ruin you. Cut out what puts you in debt. Don't you ever compromise in honoring God with your tithes and your offering. Always keep him first so that you will always be first in God. Don't you waste resources. Never throw stuff away. Somebody needs it. And always try to live debt free. She said right here, debt-free ministry, 52 acres of land with two buildings. And then listen to this. You don't think she had a vision? 
and we're going to build a retirement center and we're going to create some jobs and some revenue and we're going to circulate finances and get the body of Christ prospering. She said, God is extravagant, but he sure is not wasteful. She said he fed 5,000 men and women and children. And then after he got through, he got it all together and gave it all to his disciples. They had so much food. It was amazing. And all over one little boy willing to give some loaves and fish. Well, I, I guess I could just, just kind of keep on going with this stuff, but it just tears me up, man. I tell you, I just look at it and I can see, you know, there's no, uh, <laughs> you, you just ought to see all the stuff in here. It, it's just crazy. But, but what I'm seeing in it more than anything I'm seeing, we have taken time to focus on Corona and you need to spend time focusing on Christ. Corona is no different than everything else in the world. Uh, last week, you know, I had all those statistics and they got messed up and I got real tickled. I, I got got through and I'm telling Wendell about this, but you can pull it up on, on, on your uh, phone easy. I've never seen it before until this morning, but I ask it again. What What is the death rate in the whole world? What's going on? And they have a calendar clock running just like they do with uh, the debt. You know, the trillions of debt. You see that clock and them numbers flying? Pull it up and look at it and look at the births. I mean, baby, it's humming. Look at the deaths. I'm talking about every second. And then just, just go read down to that thing. This happening as you're speaking. In about five minutes when you get through going through it, you'd be surprised at the thousands of people that died and born I'm in minutes. And so I, I'm just simply saying, people are beginning to focus. That's what I'm seeing as she's writing on the wrong thing. She focused on the word, Isaiah 61, all about the anointing, healing the brokenhearted, about the restoration, about the power of God delivering us. And here she was going through all this mess. She kept running to the word. She kept going to the brook that quenched her thirst. She kept running to the water that washed her and made her clean. When her time was up and she left this planet, you know, a lot of you people have different opinions and stuff. I've heard some of them and they're pretty bad. But I'm gonna tell you something. She knew God and she walked with God. And all of us need to be that way when it's time to literally step out of your body if we don't know him and we're not ready, we are on our own in eternity left to a devil that cares nothing about us. And God loved you so much, but he gave you the choice. And the choice is to let him come in your heart, rule and reign, or you keep your own heart and you rule and reign. And that's what a lot of people do. And if you do it to yourself, the Bible says it's death. But if you do it with unto him, you have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is so awesome, and he just loves you so much. And I'm not going to spend any more Sundays trying to talk about how the coronavirus, this or that. It is just another word in many, 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 many words of sickness and diseases. And I'm just not going to bother it because I am the head and not the tail. You are. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus. No, I don't get silly. I don't walk around just sneeze on people. I'm smile, I wash my hands. But I did all that before Corona. Everybody knows about hygiene. And just be clean. There are germs and stuff, but there's still demonic spirits that don't need a germ. There's still devils that does not need a sickness and disease. They're still attacking people's minds. And why do you think suicide's so high? Suicide is up right now like it's never been. I mean, there's stuff going on people aren't even getting a hold of. This thing's getting pretty serious in this planet, and people don't need to jump into that seriousness. They don't. You need to stay in that word. The seriousness of the problems of the world are of the world. And Jesus said they will always have it. He said they'll always have the poor. He said, but I've called you to overcome the world. I'm in it, and I'm not of it. Get on your little old computer and look up the bubble spider. That's what I feel like. And that old spider, I never seen it before. And I, I thought, what? A spider underwater? And that spider come off of that limb and hit that water. As soon as it hit a water, it was a bubble. That old spider went all under the water in a bubble. And it come out and I was watching. I said, that's amazing that a spider can get in water like a fish and never get wet. And the Lord said, well, that's what I've called you to do. 
I've called you to be in this world, just not of it. And I said, wow. He said, yes, I have a small atmosphere around you, the Holy Spirit. You're in a Holy Ghost bubble. And as long as you got that word in you and it's creating the atmosphere around you that it's creating, you walk in peace and happiness and safety. You walk. I'm being honest. My daughter and I talk about it all the time, and I bet you she's watching right now. We really, we haven't noticed anything. I mean, our house isn't shaking. Our refrigerator's not changed. We at home more than we're used to, but not really me. I kind of stay pretty busy. You can ask her. I mean, I'm gone. But this thing cannot control our lives, and I want to close and just bringing your attention to something important. I want you to think about being desensitized for just a moment because uh, I believe it was in the 30s or 40s, late 30s or 40s, Clark Gable, uh, gone with the wind they had never been cussing ever it wasn't permitted on any news or anything movies tv and at the end of the movie clark gable said personally charlotte i don't give a damn i mean it might be one or two you just got shocked but trust me i mean it shocked the world it, it, it was like what and nobody could believe it the world couldn't believe it. He said that word. Now, I know none of y'all could ever imagine hearing that word on TV. But my point is, how many times have you heard that word and not thought a thing about it on TV? Have you ever heard a worse word on TV and not thought anything about it? Your own television is desensitizing you. You got men kissing me. I know, Larry, don't say that today. You'll lose people. No, I won't. God loves everybody. He doesn't hate anybody. He doesn't hate people that are committing any kind of sexual sins. He doesn't hate adulterers. He hates adultery. He doesn't hate homosexuals. He hates homosexuality. God does not hate you. He hates sin. Oh, who do you think you are? You try, no, you're separating people and pulling them. No, I'm not. I'm just sticking with the word. That's what I'm talking about. You're so desensitized that now if you were to even bring up homosexuality, it's like, what's wrong with you? And there was a day that it'd be like, what's wrong with you for not nailing that? Why? We're so desensitized, but desensitized of what? Things that are immoral and ungodly to permit it. We're so desensitized that when the country shut down, you can go to the liquor store, and if they if it's if they selling it, you can go to the weed store, and you can go to Walmart, and you can go to the tattoo parlor. So if you can't go to church and you get depressed, at least you can get a bottle of liquor, get dosed up, and then just so you have something to do, go get a tattoo to remember what you went through. Hello, and on your way home, stop at Walmart. Buy a mask. Let me tell you something. I don't know about you guys. I'm not going to live like that. I'm not letting this desensitize me. And I'm not calling anything new normal, get back to normal. I am normal. I'm normal because I walk by faith and not by sight. And we're going to get back to what you call normal or whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to come back and spread everybody out. I'm just going to ask you to be wise, be clean, and surely you got enough decency to not hop and spit and sneeze on people. Cover your face up and sneeze on yourself. Anyway, I could go on, but desensitizing. And I'm seeing it in our country. Your freedoms is what I was really getting at. And all of a sudden, we're at a place where we're being told we can't this and we can't that from the CDC and stuff, but we are watching the end results. And most of us really know more truth about what's happening than others. And when we evaluate where we're at and what's keeping us at home, we love our government. I love you, my, my governor, I do. I love Henry McMaster, I pray for you, man. I love my president, I pray for him. I don't care if y'all hate them both, I love them and I pray for them and I admire them. But I think they're both really on our side. Because my governor told this church, you can have church. Nobody will bother you. We want you not to. We're going to ask you not to. But if you do, will you be responsible? Will you this? Will you? If there's anybody that can show responsibility, it ought to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so May 31st, Shield's going to open up. If you're not comfortable with that, it's, it's no big thing. 
You know, there's no guilt. It's just not. Hey, we all walking in Christ Jesus, we free. And if you're comfortable to stay at home, that's, that's fine. But your freedoms and your liberty to worship your God and this country are protected by the Constitution of the United States of America. And this country is run by the people, not the government. The government is set up by the people for the people to say what the people said say. We're being so desensitized that we look to the government to tell us how to live, what to do. Well, I'm not interested in them giving me a paycheck, telling me where to live, how to live, what I can have, when I can't have it. I'll take care of myself, live where I want to live, do what I want to do, worship my God, and go where he tells me to go and what I want to do. Government, you are my slave. We pay you to work for us. We are not paying you to run our lives. And if we have to, we will all be like Michigan, if you know what I mean. But outside of that, I, I, des I, I really desire to do everything in wisdom and honor and glorify God. I don't want to be ridiculous or silly, uh, intimidative, but we're going to worship and we're going to have church. We give this thing a break. They said flatten the curve. It's flatter than flat. It's going down. Well, I'm not going to stay at home the rest of my life. I'm 67 years old. I don't know how much more I got. And I'm not going to sit at the house. And if you lock me up, I might sit there. But if it's unlocked, I'm going out the door. That's all I'm telling you. Decently, respectfully, and clean, and in faith, and not rebellious, but free. Because we are free people. And we are free to worship. And the only thing I'm getting a little righteous indignation about, you can go to the liquor store, the weed store, and get a tattoo. I'm going to tell you something. That's get a little weed. You, you go to Walmart, and mom and pop can't open their little store. I, I mean, all this has got to change. And we're going to demand it change. We're going to see it change. And we'll do it right. And we'll do it in order. And we're going to do it without violence. Because God is good. Because the voice is more powerful than vengeance and anger. The voice and the will of God is greater than all of the other. Amen. Time short. Guess I better turn you loose. You graduates probably want to go ahead and start working on your next degree. I know you need to get out of here to do that. But we love all of you so much. And I'm excited about church firing back up. And I'm and listen, <laughs> tell you how much fired up I am. That was my personal once a year vacation week. That was the only time they can come. And I said, well, that's all right. I will, I will leave vacation on the 4th just to simply be here on the 5th. Because I believe the 5th of July is a very prophetic day. And there's a reason for that. I know they're coming to do supernatural. There's something about them being here. I'm telling you. Ben, if you're watching this morning, I can't wait, bro. Hurry up and get your bad self down here and release all the God's got in you. You and your wife come and just pour it out. We'll drink it up because we hungry for God. I want revival. I want to see signs, wonders, and miracles. And I want to pastor a church of hungry people that want to go do the word. And I'm telling you. Now, say this with me now. Let us all dismiss. And even if you fired up, know you haven't sinned in a year. <laughs> say this to me anyway. Say, oh, God. Everybody in here, help me. Say, oh, God. I'm asking you right now. Forgive me of all sin. Cleanse my heart. And from this day forward, I will never be the same. I receive Christ now. In Jesus' name. If you said that and you meant that, it is done. I'd just love to water baptize you and anchor that down. But don't you let anybody steal that from you. And for those of you that's been walking with God, made some mistakes, let that cleanse that mistake up. Get it out. Quit thinking about you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have. I wish I hadn't, I hadn't. If you've done that more than once, you got to stop. If you're doing it every day, you've created a habit. Just like the way you drive to go somewhere. Stop it. You can change it. That's what my wife's saying right here. Stop it. He's giving you beauty for ashes. Quit wallowing in the ashes. Hallelujah. He's giving you holiness. Receive it and walk into it. He made you righteous. Receive it and walk into it. He called you healed. Receive it and say, hey, Lord, this old beat up body, I call it healed. You said, you said, let the weak say I'm strong. You said, let the poor say I'm rich. I say I'm strong. I say I'm rich in God. 
God. And I thank him for every good and perfect gift that comes down from heaven into my life. And I release that anointing in you in Jesus' name. Woo! I love you. God bless you. Until we get back together, go do the word. Amen. Thank all of you. It's the biggest crowd we've had, I guess.